Thank you for, for the kind invitation. And, and over the next uh, half an hour or so of the lecture, these are some of the areas I thought would be relevant. First of all, an understanding of what's changing in CDIF. Why are we even having this discussion here when CDIF was actually always considered a bit of a nuisance but not really a big pathogen? We'll highlight the current management a little bit because it leads to the future uh, you know, novel therapies that Ramesh will talk about. And then finally, I'll discuss C. difficile infection and the solid organ transplant. If time permits, I'll show you a couple of slides about our experiences in the stem cell transplant at Carmanos. So when you look at C. difficile, all of you are familiar with this slide. If there's one point I'd like to highlight, is that problem arises from the ability of C. difficile bacillus to form spores. Spores are resistant to antimicrobial therapy, and they persist both in the gut, and the patient contaminates the environment. And these spores are highly resistant to the standard hospital disinfectants. So on one side, you have it residing. It regerminates, causes recurrence disease. And the next patient who comes by occupies that room. If you're not meticulous in our infection control measures, they acquire the spores and that leads to infection. So that is the big problem that you're dealing with with C. diff. We do know that the single most important risk factor after you acquire C. difficile spores that leads to symptomatic disease is exposure to broad spectrum antibiotics that suppress the normal flora and that leads to the development of symptomatic CDI. So if I took 100 people off the streets, about 5 to 7% will be colonized with toxigenic C. diff. If I took 100 patients, about 20% of those patients will be colonized with C. diff. If someone walks in and acquires C. diff, and they're also exposed to antibiotics, the incubation period to development of disease is very fast. It's within four days. So it happens very quickly. So this is not something that hangs around in your gut for a long period of time. And that the majority of people may carry it but not get symptoms, but there is a significant group that can develop symptoms very quickly. If you look at the burden of disease, and this is data from the National Inpatient Wide Sample, or HCUP data, you can see that something happened between 2001 and 2005 where we saw a sudden doubling of hospitalizations related to C. diff. So they looked at the discharge data, and if it stated C. diff as a primary or a secondary diagnosis, you can see it here. So you see a doubling of the rates. They have now leveled off, and we are hopeful that they are starting to trend down. But there is another thing that was very apparent, that C. diff is a disease that affects the elderly. Elderly are at greater risk for acquisition and also for the development of symptomatic disease. So if you look here, if you're over 65, you have three times the risk. And if you're over 85, the risk is considerably higher. So when you think of your C. diff patient, even in the transplant population, age still happens to play a role in this setting. And finally, what this data tells us is there's a price not merely for the patient, but the length of stay is longer compared to those without C. diff. Mortality is higher, and this is inpatient mortality, the mean cost and the aggregate estimated cost. So it's not merely a disease that certainly impacts patients, but it also impacts the healthcare costs, and it is potentially preventable. So what really happened, why are we having this discussion today, is because in 2000 and 2003, both here and in Canada, we started seeing a whole lot of life-threatening C. difficile infections resulting in colectomies in a significant number of people. And when they examined this, they collected all of the strains. By that time, you had several outbreaks that are listed between the two red lines. And when they looked at it, they realized that the toxinotype, the binary toxin, the presence, and a deletion in the repressor gene for the toxin production were all present in historic strains. So what was different about the strain? So just before we get there, by this time, if you see that at least half of the patients who were involved in these outbreaks had the strain that they call as the North American pulse field type 1 or the B10127 strain. What was different compared to the historic controls was the resistance to fluoroquinolones. If you look here, for instance, you can see where I've highlighted GATI and moxifloxacin. If you look at the current NAP1 isolates in column 2, you can see that they are 100% resistant to the fluoroquinolones. If you look at the current not NAP1 strains, the resistance is much less. And if you look at the historic strains in the second last column, 
none of them are resistant to the fluoroquinolones. And this is also the time when there's increasing use of respiratory fluoroquinolones. So I would say when you pick someone for treatment with one of these newer fluoroquinolones, which have a lot of anaerobic activity, this is one agent you might want to use with some degree of prudence. There are two toxins that actually uh, act in causing the inflammation. You'll are familiar with both toxin A and B. The strains, NAP1 strains, also have a binary toxin that's very similar to the Clostridium perfringens toxin, but the actual virulence of this is still being examined. This is the pathogenicity locus, and these are the genes that lead to the production of the toxin. And if you see the gene that has the line across it, the red line, that is a negative B repressor. This actually suppresses toxin production, and there's actually a deletion in this gene, which results in a significant increase in toxin production, both A and B. So in blue, what you see there is toxin production by the NAP1 strain, and in red, you see the standard strains. And what's interesting about the toxin production is there's toxin production during the logarithmic growth phase, which is something very unusual. Generally, toxin production happens when it plateaus out. So this strain can produce immense amount of toxin in a very short period of time, leading to a very fulminant process that can affect even younger people, which was a characteristic hallmark of this particular infection. So just to summarize the epidemiology, we have noticed since 2000, 2001, an increase in cases of C. diff, increase in the severity. Although it generally affects the elderly, there are young people also at low risk who seem to get the strain which is characterized by increased toxin production, the presence of a potential new virulence factor, and increasing resistance to the neofluoroquinolones. What are the risk factors? The risk factors really haven't changed, and I'll go over this in some detail just for one reason, that there are really no novel risk factors in the transplant population. They seem to be tied into the traditional risk factors. By far, it's exposure to broad-spectrum antimicrobial therapy and residence in a healthcare facility. So you acquire the strain in the facility, and then you get disrupted flora because of the antimicrobial use. Advanced age, there is, as you'll see later, the transplant population has a slightly increased risk for C. diff, which may even translate into increased adverse outcomes. The use of proton pumps, even though it's controversial, whether inhibition of gastric acid prevents destruction of the spores, but that is thought to be possibly the risk factor for increased acquisition. This may be interesting because when we travel overseas, what do we take with us? Cipro. If you take Cipro, uh, not Cipro, Omeprazole, if you're on a PPI, you have a slightly increased risk for traveler's diarrhea. It's believed that you, know, you kind of uh, negate the uh, protective effect. The FDA actually has increased uh, you know, an alert saying that PPIs have been associated with an increased risk of CDI. So when you have the recurrent C. difficile patient, besides restricting antimicrobial use, you might give some thought to stopping the PPIs or the H2 blockers in these patients as the first step in preventing recurrence. So when we look at all of our transplant patients, all of them are on Bactrim. But fortunately, Bactrim is less implicated as a cause the most frequently implicated drugs are clindamycin, which has got great anaerobic activity, but very little activity against C. difficile, broad-spectrum penicillins. The second and third generation, second generation because they affect anaerobic flora in the gut, and fluoroquinolones. The rarely implicated are metronidazole, vanco, aminoglycosides, tetracyclines. They may also be rarely implicated partially because we seldom use some of those agents anymore. If you were to do the diagnostic tests, the culture remains the gold standard, but it's labor intensive. You never know whether you have isolated a toxigenic strain or a non-toxigenic strain. So you have to do cytotoxin assays. So out of sheer convenience, the toxin testing evolved to ELISA testing. Unfortunately, the ELISA test would have missed between 15 and 20% of the cases. So currently, what's used at Henry Ford, which seems to work extremely well, is you do a screen with the GDH test, which detects the presence of any form of C. diff, toxigenic or non-toxigenic, and if it is positive, then you do the ELISA test, which then tells you, is it a toxigenic strain or a non-toxigenic strain? So this is the current standard testing that we have here. A couple of additional words about testing. 
testing non-diarrheal stools, except in a patient who has a toxic megacolon and doesn't have diarrhea, you really shouldn't be doing it because you will pick up asymptomatic carriage. And then you won't know what to do with that. And at this time, treatment of asymptomatic carriers is not indicated. Retesting, because some of these patients, particularly the graft versus host disease patients, have persistent diarrhea, you might want to wait at least a week or wait till something else has changed. Otherwise, you'll get, if you do the same test repeatedly, you'll get the same, same result. So generally, we advocate waiting at least five to seven days in patients with chronic diarrhea. And finally, testing for cure, it's not very helpful because C. diff can remain there for a while, and whether you test it for cure, what you're looking for is resolution of symptoms rather than resolution or eradication of this pose, because two weeks later, the spores can regerminate, and you can still find it. So these are some of the things to keep in mind in practical. Another practical thing is to try and categorize them. Are they severe or severe complicated? Why should we know this? because there is some data that suggests that the use of oral vancomycin may be <coughs> preferable in the serious or serious complicated cases. So severity in a very practical term uh, is defined as by the IDSA and SHEA as leukocytosis over 15,000 or a doubling uh, 1.5 times the increase in creatinine from onset of disease. Severe complicated is all of the above, plus you have development of distension indicative of ileus, you have in hemodynamic instability, and just keep in mind, when you develop a toxic megacolon ileus, diarrhea often resolves. But that doesn't mean they often still have, maybe actually a poor prognostic marker in some of these patients. Therapy, very quickly, if you can stop the offending antibiotic, do so. If you can restrict the spectrum of activity of the antibiotic and use something that's not so broad spectrum, that's even better. So targeted therapy is often preferable. The therapy, as we know, is metronidazole given orally or oral vanco. In some patients, we do. Ramesh is going to talk about fecal transplantation. We are hoping that the Transplant Institute will pull up, put this up on their website <laughs> as you know, one more transplantation we offer. <laughs> but uh, some of the other things that have been tried and really not to be and hasn't been proven is actually toxin binders, the use of IVIG, and such. I'll talk a little bit about these. Traditionally, the efficacy of metronidazole and vancomycin was comparable. The relapse rates, whichever agent you use, there'll be a 15% relapse rate approximately, and both these agents take about four days to completely resolve. So don't look for resolution of symptoms before four or five days. That is sort of the time period where you expect. So lately, though, we have seen in after the outbreak occurred and when we started seeing very severe disease, we have seen failures. And the last study by Zar and Al, where they actually randomized patients to get metronidazole or oral vancomycin actually showed in patients who met criteria for severe C. diff, the response rate with metronidazole was just 76% compared to 97%. So herein lies the reason why we try and stratify them, are they severe or not? And what's the principle behind that? If you take oral metronidazole, by the time it gets to the colon, almost 85% of the drug has been absorbed. So you have 15% left in the stool. Some of it gets resecreted. So you get a level in the stool highest of about 10 micrograms per gram of stool. The MIC is two of metronidazole to C. difficile. As the inflammation and diarrhea resolves, it becomes almost undetectable in the stool as the colon in, you know, improves. So it's good during acute inflammation. If you throw a whole lot of oral vancomycin 125Q6, you get levels after four days that start from 150 to 800. And the MIC is one to C. diff. So by increasing to 250 and all, you may not be achieving much more. You're well over the MIC with 125. So that's the reason why it's believed that vancomycin, in severe cases, you have a better chance of getting more drug there that will affect a kill. So the indications are when you fail after about five days with metronidazole, if there's any allergy or intolerance to metronidazole, if you have severe C. diff, fulminant C. diff, we'll talk about that, you use IV and oral banco, and then recurrent C. diff. Okay. So just to recap, mild to moderate, 
no leukocytosis, serum creatinine okay, patient looks stable, metronidazole for about 10 to 14 days. Severe infection, high leukocytosis, doubling of the creatinine, patient seems unwell, you move to vancomycin would be your choice. And if you have severe complicated, you give oral vanco in a higher dose because you hope some of that gets to the colon and use IV metronidazole because some of that will get secreted into the colon. The use of using intracolonic installation and so on, you should do on an individual basis because it carries a risk for colonic perforation. And then this is a big problem. 20% of these patients will come back with a recurrence. If you do have a recurrence and it was treated the first time and responded, use the same treatment. The second recurrence is where we would advocate using vancomycin. The taper is indicated because as the spores that survive regerminate after a couple of weeks, you can then eliminate the regerminated spores because there's still some vancomycin in the system. It's very limited, this data. It hasn't been studied in any sort of randomized fashion. Fulman and C. diff, the only role here, this would be a patient who is refractory. This happens in about 3% of these cases, may end up requiring some form of surgery. Something interesting, which you all may be more familiar with, is some data from Pittsburgh in about 140 patients where they've actually done a diverting ileostomy where they inject first intraoperatively golightly in the distal segment, that's the colonic segment, and then they give 500 milligram infusions, Q8 hours of vancomycin for 10 days. And this has resulted in a mortality rate of 19% versus 52%. And it has been colon sparing in about 93% of cases. So this is something novel, which might be something to consider in case you run across patients. You know. But even with surgery for fulminant colitis, the mortality is approximately 50%. So recurrent C. diff, and this is where Ramesh will come in a bit later, but 20%, if you get one recurrence, you will get much more recurrences subsequently. And this is not because of metronidazole uh, resistance or vancomycin resistance. So how do we manage recurrence? Avoid unnecessary antibiotic exposure. Try and keep them out of the hospital if you can. Uh, and then many empirical regimens, we talked about some of these. What we would recommend is vancomycin taper after the second recurrence, and then we'll talk about some of the others a bit later. Among all of this, the probiotics, particularly Saccharomyces boulardii, has been shown in a Cochrane database analysis to have some protective effect. But I will caution you that there are many different companies that make this, and it's very specific lots that were used in some of these tests that seem to be effective. Finally, what new therapies are there on the horizon? And this is something that we are trying to bring on board in a select group of patients is fidexomycin. Fidexomycin was tested head-to-head -head against vancomycin with a primary endpoint looking for recurrence, defined as a second episode at 28 days. And if you look at the initial response to vancomycin uh, and so on, it was comparable. But if you look at the re recurrence rate at 28 days after resolution of symptoms, it was 24% in vancomycin and 13% in fidexomycin. Simplistically, this could be believed to be because it's less collateral damage, because it's very targeted against C. difficile, but there's increasing data showing that fidexomycin interferes with sporulation. So it inhibits sporulation, and that might be partly also some of the reason for its effectiveness in preventing recurrence. So this is something to keep in mind. However, if you look at the cost, you'll see that metronidazole is $15 a day, we make up the slurry using IV vancomycin, and that's $25 for the 10-day course. If you actually buy vancomycin puvules, the, it's 1600 and a 10-day course of fidexomycin is 2600 So there has to be some cost-benefit analysis, and you have to kind of select your patients. So if I were to ask you which are the patients at higher risk for recurrence, there are probably just three things you can look at. If they're over 65, if the first episode was severe, and if they remain on antibiotics, these are the three things that consistently show up as markers. And maybe that might be a niche for fidexomycin, though the studies have yet to be done. But subset analysis of this data shows that in case you had to keep patients on concomitant antibiotics, fidexomycin, they perform better than vancomycin. So 
The two investigational treatments that are marked here are something novel. One is the Merck monoclonal antibodies. We have enrolled six patients at Henry Ford into the study. The premise is that recurrence may be because the patients don't mount an adequate immune response with antibody production. So these are monoclonal antibodies that were uh, kind of published in the New England Journal two years ago, which is now in phase three trials. So this is ongoing. Uh, the other approach is the use of non-toxigenic C. diff by Virofarma because it's believed if you give someone a slurry of non-toxigenic C. diff, it seems to be protective against toxigenic C. diff. So that's another set of studies that seem quite novel. All the others seem to be sort of me too drugs without any novel approaches. I'm gonna shift gears just quickly to solid organ transplant. If you look at the data in solid organ transplant, we know looking at this data, if you look at the bottom in the non-transplant patient, the incidence of C. diff in non-surgical patients is 2%, in surgical patients about 6%. If you look at the incidence in the other transplants, though, by and large, looking at any organ, it's higher. Some of this is reflective of the center, some of it is reflective of the time at which the study was done. Did it happen after the outbreaks? Some of it is reflective about selection bias, but this is something to look into. So just to kind of equalize some of that, this was a recent paper that was published. It uses the same uh, national inpatient-wide database that we looked at, but they looked at just 2009. And in 2009, there were 8 million discharges in the US from 1,000 hospitals. So that's the database. When they looked at it, they found close to 50,000 patients who were solid organ transplant patients, and they examined all of them. Did they have a discharge diagnosis of C. difficile as well? And it was thought to be 2.7%. In the rest of the non-transplant population in this database, the incidence was 0.8%. So we know clearly there's a higher incidence. Which organ seems to be at the greatest risk or associated with greater risk, it appears to be the liver and lung transplant. When you look at these patients, this may be reflective of the type of immune suppression you use. It may be reflective of the time they spend in the hospital and exposure to antimicrobial therapy. So this is something that there are no studies, and this is one of the things that we are looking into right now in our liver transplant patients, but this kind of seems to be the risk. There are a few other things that you can look into here. If you look at columns two and three, column number two is solid organ transplants without C. diff. Column number three is solid organ transplants with C. diff. And if you look at the first p-value, this compares the two groups. And you'll see a few things seem to follow that's associated with greater risk. One is older age, uh, female gender doesn't drop out, white ethnicity. And this seems to be significant even in our own database. You know even when you control for other factors. Charlson's comorbidity index of greater than three, that seems to be an important risk. The presence of any of these three infections that they could extract using ICD-9 codes, UTI, pneumonia, CMV. CMV may be, it's an immunomodulator. The other two may be exposure to prolonged antibiotic therapy that you may be treating. Or it may identify a subset of patients at greater risk because of greater degrees of immune suppression. One more point, when you look at the adverse impact, you'll see, as I showed you initially, the mortality, if you look at solid organs without C. diff and those with C. diff, it was 2.4 and 7.4. So two and a half times the greater inpatient, in-hospital mortality. This is not long-term mortality. Similarly, you can see the length of stay was greater. As for the charges, organ complications, they defined as either graft failure or graft rejection. Using those two variables, you can see it was also significant, even though the numbers seem relatively small. Colectomy, surprisingly, was highest in the non-transplant population. They now factored in age, they factored in comorbidities, but it still seems to stand out as a greater risk. So some of the points you may wish to consider, the transplant patient population is somewhat younger. After the transplant, you're keeping a close surveillance on the patient you intervene very rapidly. So there's timely intervention. And transplant patients are often managed by surgeons who understand the need for you know, maybe doing colectomies, things like that in a timely manner. But that's something that seems to stand out. But clearly see the facile patients had more colectomies than others.
Are there any differences? Maybe fulminant colitis is greater in this group of patients, 13% versus 3 to 8% in the general population. Fever seems to be a bit higher and ileus in about a quarter of these patients. By far, if you look at all the literature, the efficacy to this approach, metronidazole vancomycin seems comparable. There's nothing different in the two groups, except in the non-transplant group, there's higher risk for colectomies. So I would say the standard approach would likely work in the transplant population as well. Just the last part of my discussion is looking at our data. This I have to thank uh, one of our residents, Chetan uh, Mittal, who is on call. I don't know if he's here today, and Sami Arshad, and two medical students who collected all of this data. I believe, uh, uh, you know, you all had started working on this in the early part when you all had seen a lot. But this looks at 970 liver transplant patients at Henry Ford between 2000 and 2010. <coughs> the overall prevalence, the follow-up was till December 31st, 2011. So if people died before that, they died. But that was the follow-up period. We looked at, did anyone get a diagnosis of C. diff based on diarrhea and a positive stool for C. diff? It was 19%. So that translates to 183 out of the 973 patients. 3.3 had C. difficile diagnosed during that admission for transplant, but before the transplant, telling you the common traditional risk factors are probably at play and not the transplant risk factors. Uh, nine, I don't have the data shown here, but 26% of these patients would have met the definition for C. diff based on a white cell count of greater than 15,000. None of these patients died from C. diff. There were five colectomies, one of them in 2003, one in 2006, two in 2008, and one in 2009, and nothing since then. Okay, so that is some of the severity data and outcome data. We also looked at, did they have onset of disease in the community, meaning C. difficile was diagnosed within three days of hospital admission, and it was 62%. So they can present with C. diff from the community, but if you look at all of them, they had been in the hospital within the last two months. So, you know, it's probably still a nosocomially transmitted hospital acquired infection. The community onset, be a bit careful because they get missed. They are at home, they are not in the hospital, they're suspicious of C. diff because in the stem cell data, community onset patients at Carmanos, we know, had a worse outcome than hospital onset because we are on top of it very quickly. The recurrence rate was comparable to the non-transplant population. The time to recurrence was actually late. So if you use the study criteria of four weeks, you'll miss many of the recurrence cases. So these are some of the regression analysis, and I have to say this is preliminary data, but these are all controlled for all the variables in this. So what I've highlighted in green the year of the transplant seems to be important, and I'll see, give you some data regarding that. White race seems to stand out again, even when controlled for other factors. The initial MELD score, and I believe we start off with a high MELD score for transplant recipients, so, you know, till 40 is not a big stretch, but it seems to be a risk factor, a MELD score pre-transplant. Then the last thing is the length of stay. And this, I have to say, is not a risk factor. This is likely an outcome measure that these patients stayed longer, so we can attribute it possibly to C. diff, but we are looking at this data. So the year of transplant, if you look at this, 2007 and 2008, if you look at one year freedom from infection from C. diff, you'll see 2007 and 2008, you were most likely to get C. difficile infection. And that's not surprising, because if you look at all the infection rates, and this is how we count infection and infection control as per 10,000 patient days. You'll see that we sort of peaked in 2000, 2008, and then it sort of declined. So that compares to what we see here. This is the most intriguing part of the data. Even though one-year mortality did not seem different, this may identify a subset of patients that are at greater risk for overall mortality. And this, like I said, data was censored at December 31st, 2011 and whenever patients died. So we'll have something more to tell you once we look at this information. So just to summarize, overall we see a high incidence of C. diff in sli liver and lung transplant appear to be at greater risk, older age, white race comorbidities, concomitant infections associated with greater risk, 
and there seems to be a higher mortality, organ complications, and prolonged length of stay. If you, so what are the clinical implications? There are not many factors we can modify. We cannot modify comorbidities, age, and so on, but we can certainly modify our antibiotic use. We can certainly promptly think of it, diagnose, treat, and finally adhere meticulous infection control, which is this. And does infection control actually work? If you look at our own data, I showed you this just a moment ago. What happened in 2008 is this was thought to be, and some interventions were put in place. The interventions were basically the development of a CDI bundle. So contact plus precautions for the duration of hospital stay, soap and water because alcohol sort of doesn't kill spores as well, cleaning of the environment every day, the high touch surfaces with bleach, and then monitoring high end hygiene practice and auditing it, monitoring environmental cleaning practices, education campaign, and the lab went to a more sensitive means of testing. And we also put in place, if you are testing, the patient should be in contact isolation. Okay? You don't wait till the test results, but real time reporting, and then enhanced stewardship. So certainly we saw a decline in rates. We know the strategy works. The other outcomes was a decrease, as you can see, in 2010 of the antibiotic budget expenditure. And you can see the colectomy data that overall for the hospital that has declined. So I think I'll stop here. There were a couple more slides on stem cell. I think we'll leave that for another day because the discussion is very, I'll just say that just looking at our Carmanos data, we are doing a prospective study where everyone admitted to BMT gets a stool uh, culture done on admission and weekly thereafter, we have found colonization with C. diff in 14% of patients at the time of admission with a non-toxigenic stain in about 21%. And we are thinking of strategies because everyone colonized with a toxigenic stain got disease within five days. So we are starting to think, is there a role for preemptive therapy maybe? Is there a role for active surveillance? But we'll discuss that data at another time. So I'll stop here and have Ramesh come up and carry on with the rest of the discussion. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Abuljuth, for the invite, and thanks, Dr. Langarn. So from the science, we go into the magical world of uh, intestinal microbiota transplantation or uh, fecal transplantation. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, intestinal microbiota transplantation, basic facts, uh, what is uh, known uh, global experience, uh, and our own experience uh, and uh, uh, summary slides. So if you think it is yuck, uh, maybe not, because uh, this is a, a chain of restaurant uh, in the Far East, uh, and it's uh, theme based on toilets, and that's the dessert in the bottom. Okay. Uh, but uh, if you have one patient like this, which has a toxic megacolon, then you would really want to do something for uh, something uh, extraordinary uh, to prevent this uh, uh, disease or take care of this problem. So if you look at human enterobiome, uh, uh, the human intestinal microbiota has at least documented 300 to 500 species of microorganism and 10 to the power of 12 bacterial cells per uh, gram of stool. So if you look at the stool overall, there are more bacterial cells than the total number of human cells uh, put together. And now we know that intestinal microbiota uh, is the true organ in itself. It has a major role in metabolism and immune function. And uh, in Clostridium difficile infection and inflammatory bowel disease, for example, we have altered intestinal microbiota. And now we know that uh, there are the in intestinal microbiota plays a huge role in metabolic syndrome, obesity, systemic autoimmunity, uh, uh, in transplant rejection. So the list goes on and on now. So uh, we know that in uh, C. diff infection, we have altered intestinal ecosystem. So how do you fix the altered intestinal ecosystem? We can do what we call as prebiotics. These are non-digestible dietary components, basically different uh, polysaccharides, uh, that selectively stimulate growth and activity of beneficial bacteria in the colon. Or you could do probiotics, uh, which Dr. Langadon uh, discussed. Uh, and we can uh, see that uh, there is only limited role for probiotics so far in successful management of C. diff. We can do fecal insulation, uh, which is minimally processed tool that restore, restores colonic uh, homeostasis. Or 
we can do synthesized tool. We have not gotten there yet. Uh, uh, so the only thing we have left over is fecal installation. So uh, this is uh, uh, something that has been around, uh, uh, well known since the 17th century. Uh, uh, animals are far more advanced in thinking about fecal transplant than human beings, uh, and they know what to do. They eat poop uh, if they have diarrhea, uh, and uh, uh, that takes care of uh, uh, their diarrhea. And farmers uh, have been routinely using uh, 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 normal stools and instilling into diarrheal stools for horses. So it's been going on for uh, at least 100 years uh, uh, in the farm animals. So you can call INT. Uh, 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 transplant as the ultimate probiotic because uh, it's a transfer of fresh stool specimen from a healthy donor, typically a, a close relative or spouse, to the patient. And there is excellent experience in treating recurrent C. diff infection, but there is limited experience in treating uh, severely ill C. diff infection and uh, people with primary therapy, uh, primary C. diff infection who are very refractory. And we're going to show Henry Ford data where we have done uh, some better things compared to the world's literature. And there is a minimal experience of successful uh, treatment uh, for inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, reducing insulin resistance. And now I recently read a couple of papers on treating colonic graft versus host disease with intestinal uh, microbiota transplantation. Uh, I don't know whether Dr. Uh, Janik Raman will agree with me, but, but ne <laughs> nevertheless, it's coming there. It's coming. So this is the very first uh, uh, fecal transplant patient that I saw in May of 2010. Uh, this is a 53-year-old woman who was admitted uh, with uh, C. diff infection. Uh, she failed medical therapy with IV metronidazole and oral vancomycin, was treated for about 10 days. Her hospital course was complicated by uh, uh, megacolon, not really toxic, but definitely megacolon. And you can see that where, uh, uh, the x-ray on the left-hand side and the CAT scan, uh, she had huge uh, 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 colonic uh, the, uh, diameters and circumference. Uh, so there was no clinical improvement noted over 10 days. So the patient was evaluated for possible colectomy, but she had a, such a poor cardiac status, they felt that she won't survive the surgery. Uh, oral rifaximin and IV immunoglobulin were added without any significant improvement. So we decided to uh, uh, do the intestinal microbiota uh, transplantation. And was, uh, her daughter was the healthy stool donor and NG tube was uh, placed, and, uh, and the next morning when I came for rounds, the patient said, where's my cigarette and pizza? Uh, prior to that, she, had a, uh, she, she couldn't get out of the uh, toilet, uh, so it was that dramatic. So the patient started to improve dramatically within 24 hours, and uh, this is the imaging, uh, subsequent imaging, which showed dramatic improvement uh, of the uh, megacolon. So who can be a stool donor? Uh, anybody? Uh, uh, if they have not received any antibiotics, you want normal flora, so at least three months or so. If you, you shouldn't have any acute or chronic diarrheal illness, and you should not be on any immune suppression, no chemotherapy, and definitely no prior history of CDI. So f spouse, family members, or any willing adult, uh, uh, anybody ca uh, can be a donor. What do you screen for a normal donor? Just like organ transplantation, uh, we do screen for serologies for uh, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, and, and tryponema, uh, uh, syphilis. So we check serologies uh, diligently for all these people, uh, uh, for the stool donors. And you may uh, do stool studies for C. diff, either by toxin or PCR. Uh, you can do uh, uh, check for enteric bat uh, bacterial pathogens, or also check for ova and parasites, but those are not necessarily recommend recommended for everybody. History is far more important along with the blood testing. So. Uh, if you look at the global experience, this is an excellent review that was published in uh, Clinical Infection Disease Journal in 2011. And there, they looked at 317 patients uh, uh, from 27 case series and reports. And uh, the success rate uh, for preventing recurrence uh, and resolution was close to 92% uh, in this study. So if you look at uh, uh, subsequent studies that have been reported and look at all the uh, 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 ones. So if you look at uh, this uh, group of uh, uh, studies, uh, this is from 98 to 2012. Uh, if you look at uh, this is where uh, the predominant experience with uh, fecal <coughs> transplant is. It's completely through colonoscopy. Uh, predominantly through colonoscopy, there are about 340 patients or so in this uh, 
uh, put together total one, about 19 people uh, failed to resolve. So it had a dramatic success rate, about 95% uh, uh, success rate, and it worked uh, dramatically. I want to point out uh, uh, item number 12, uh, where uh, uh, in New York, Dr. Brand's uh, group, they did a very long-term follow-up uh, up to beyond, uh, beyond 100 days and showed their success rate was dramatic as well. And then I want to point out number 15, where they uh, took completely standardized healthy donors, healthy donors, uh, and uh, fr froze their samples, uh, and then completely unrelated healthy donors froze their samples, and then rethought them and used it, and successfully showed that you can do this. So you can actually have a stool bank and successfully work with that as well. So what about uh, enemas? So 1958, Dr. Eisman's group, and uh, this uh, he happens to be in University of Colorado, uh, and they he did the first uh, fecal transplant through an enema, uh, and. But uh, enemas, there is a problem is it doesn't reach beyond maybe sigmoid colon if you are success if you are lucky. But if you look at numbers, uh, enemas have worked. But if you go back and read all the studies on all of them, they were really mild disease people, except for about under 10 people. Uh, I think it's about five or six people in the total literature who had uh, a severe disease that had some response to uh, uh, enemas. Uh, of fecal uh, transplantation. Otherwise, uh, uh, enemas are useful only for very mild disease, and so typically it's done in Europe uh, uh, as a home-based infusion. In Australia, it's done routinely. So there, they don't ask questions; they just do it. Uh, so, whereas uh, less experience with the nasogastric tube, there are problems with nasogastric tube uh, installation methods. The problems are uh, you have to bypass the stomach acid. So that's one. Plus, it has to go through several uh, feet of uh, small intestine before it reaches the colon. So those are issues. So, uh, uh, and then if a patient has severe ileus, we don't know whether that will reach the place or not. But having uh, said that, uh, this is about 100 patients or so, and about 14, per, uh, 14 people did not uh, 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 resolve. Uh, but they had varying issues in terms of how they administered, how much they administered, so it's not standardized. This is through NG tube. So overall, the success rate comes to about 90 to 90 to 95 percent overall, whichever uh, route, uh, 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 whichever route you choose to do. So what are all the potential problems? Maybe you don't, you cannot get a good donor. We have had, uh, we have had a problem like that. We had one pa one patient admitted to where uh, the, uh, the family said, "We can't come. I'm sorry, we have no money. Uh, we live far away." So I I pointed <laughs> my finger to the uh, intern. I said, "Hey, you're the donor." So he, uh, he promptly agreed and did it and successful, uh, successful. That patient was tremendous success. Uh, and what about new pathogens that may be introduced with donor samples? So far in the literature, not, nothing has been reported, but you know, I had to keep fingers crossed because we are not screening for every pathogen. And uh, what about if any physical complications? None reported today. Medical legal? No, it's, just, uh, it's sort of established and it's there in the guidelines as well now. If you fail certain things, you can go to fecal transplantation. Well, uh, problem is no money. Mm, uh, there's no billing code yet. Uh, so John Bartlett, who's the infectious disease uh, guru of uh, America, and if he, he stands and uh, says the best hospital system in the, uh, in the country, which is Johns Hopkins, cannot do fecal transplantation, uh, the best treatment for C. diff infection, just the highest success rate because there's no ICD code. Uh, so, uh, so that is the, uh, so we are trying to work with the system and try to see if we can go through this uh, at this point. Um, and if you might wonder, is it aesthetically appealing, unappealing to the patients? But when patients suffer, they say, Doc, just do it. So what are, uh, uh, do we have any randomized trials? So if you look at uh, uh, Minnesota tried to do a trial, uh, it's all GI group, and they tried to do an open-labeled uh, randomized trial recruiting conventional therapy versus fecal transplantation. They failed miserably. They could not recruit a single patient to the conventional arm. Everybody wanted fecal transplant, so it became a case series. Uh, and Toronto is open now since 2010, trying to recruit patients uh, for conventional visits. This one, McMaster, did a unique thing where they decided to do uh, frozen visits, a fresh specimen. So that's ongoing as we speak. The FECAL trial is the only successfully enrolled trial in the Netherlands, uh, and uh, we are hoping to get the results out of that soon. It's still, uh, I believe the last I checked in November, was still recruiting, the, uh, the total number was 120. So I think we are almost uh, near the end. So we'll have uh, uh, probably at least one randomized trial that say that. Is there any randomized trial for other diseases? Of course. Mm, uh, there's a trial called fat loose. 
uh, trial. It is for uh, fecal transplant studying insulin resistance, obesity, uh, and there is a, a, a randomized trial for ulcerative colitis done by McMaster. So people are already ahead of the game uh, uh, in this, and they feel like altering entro, uh, entrobiome is the key for future. Okay. Uh, can't say it on uh, 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 its live stream, uh, but <laughs> most patients who I, uh, or every patient that I've ever uh, talked to, they say just do it. Uh, so what is Henry Ford's experience? So we decided to study the, uh, assess the efficacy and safety of uh, fecal transplant performed at our medical center. So it's a, re it's a retrospective study, and uh, we looked at all fecal transplants done between May 2010 and June 2012. There were 49 patients, and I have to say that since then, since then we have literally doubled the number in the past six months or so. We have doubled the number of fecal transplants. But 49 patients were uh, eligible for this study, uh, and they underwent IMT during the study period. And uh, they were usually referrals because of infectious disease cancers. And data was abstracted for demographics, uh, comorbidities, antimicrobial use, severity of CDI, and the number of CDI episodes. CVI CDI uh, was defined if you had at least uh, two or more of the uh, clinical criteria, such as uh, age greater than 60, serum albumin less than 2.5 milligrams per deciliter, temperature greater than 38.3 degrees centigrade, white blood cell count of 15,000 or higher uh, within 48 hours of diagnosis, or endoscopic evidence of pseudomembranous colitis uh, and, and treatment in an intensive care setting in the presence of uh, documented CDI. So what are the, uh, uh, we, we had a much more stringent criteria compared to all studies that were published. Uh, a resolution was a cessation or 50% decrease in diarrhea within seven days of fecal transplant. Recurrence was defined uh, as CDI uh, uh, that occurred within 100 days of post-resolution uh, of the original uh, infection. So typically, most studies have included only four weeks uh, as the cutoff, including the fidaxomycin study uh, Dr. Langarden mentioned. Uh, but we, we included 100 days just like uh, using the nosocomial definition uh, and made it much more stricter. The follow-up period was 100 days after uh, uh, intestinal microbiota transplantation. Mortality, all-cause mortality within 30 days after fecal transplant. So the standard screening was uh, done for serologies. Uh, stool was checked for uh, negative C diff uh, DNA by PCR in the donors. And the fresh uh, specimen, 30 to 50 grams, it's usually about one small urine container, the orange urine container, or two urine containers. Uh, and they were homogenized with just warm tap water and filtered through gas. So we used a very sophisticated uh, uh, tools, uh, 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 and this is it. Mm, uh, so uh, basically, it's uh, uh, simple containers, uh, a tongue depressor uh, uh, to mix, uh, and uh, warm tap water, and uh, just a uh, wi widely uh, woven gas uh, piece uh, to use as a filter, and you get your final product. Uh, so what, this is something different compared to rest of the published literature. Everybody uses a blender and some coffee filter and stuff like that. Uh, they use the blender. Nobody knows what to do with the blender. Uh, how, who's going to clean the blender? Who's going to get this one? So uh, the, Dr. Lawrence Brandt, who's a very, very uh, successful gastroenterologist, and he's probably uh, one of the uh, pioneers here uh, in uh, uh, New York, he's a bring-your-own-blender guy. Uh, bring your own blender, that's, that's his uh, 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 theme. But the problem is uh, we wanted to make it as simple and reproducible in a small place. A nursing home uh, can do it if they, if they wanted to. Instilling method is nasogastric tube. About 120 to 180 ml uh, of uh, suspension was instilled uh, with about 20 ml of free water flush. And colonics, uh, because we don't want to put too much uh, fluid in, because uh, if they aspirate, uh, there'll be... Uh, uh, fecal aspiration pneumonia. So colonoscopy can do, uh, use much larger volumes. Uh, uh, up to 500 ml can be instilled. Primary outcome was resolution of symptoms. Secondary outcome was recurrence of CDA and 30-day mortality. So we look at the patient characteristics. Uh, we had about 49 patients total, and uh, uh, the uh, mean age was 65. Uh, about 63% uh, uh, were male. Uh, uh, one interesting uh, comorbidity is cancer. About 20% had cancer, uh, and the other ones were just chronic diseases. So if you look at uh, uh, indications, uh, 11 people had primary CDI, which were refractory to conventional medical therapy, uh, and uh, 38 had recurrent CDI, of which uh, a predominant, uh, predominant portion of them, at least uh, three-fourths of them, 
had more than three episodes of recurrence. Severe CDI, uh, 15 patients had definition, uh, 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 what I mentioned earlier, uh, severe CDI, and about non-severe CDI was 34, uh, or about uh, two-thirds of the population. If you look at the severe CDI, 15 patients, uh, six of them had primary CDI refracted to medical therapy, and nine of them had recurrent CDI. And we used all kinds of donors. Unrelated donors, there were four, four people, parents, siblings, spouse, offsprings. And colonoscopy was done in uh, 12, uh, 12 of them, except for only one severe CDI patient. Every uh, colonoscopy was done for uh, uh, outpatient setting where patients were actually stable. They didn't qualify for severe disease uh, because there were because of concern for colonic perforation uh, using a colonoscopy in an actively severely inflamed colon. A nasogastric tube was used in the reminder. Number of attempts, uh, a colonoscopy only, every patient you, you're getting colonoscopy only had once, but they were the best of the patients. Uh, uh, for nasogastric tube, uh, about two people had three, three attempts, five people had two attempts, uh, and the uh, rest of them had only one attempt. About 85% had only one attempt. And uh, inpatient 21, outpatients were uh, done uh, 29 patients. So let's look at the results. So we had 49 patients to begin with. Resolution within seven days, 46 patients, uh, so 93% resolution. Uh, of which uh, three people uh, died. None of them died from CDI or the therapy. They died of their uh, underlying disease and uh, within the 30 days, which is usually cancer. Uh, and 43% uh, were still alive in 30 days. And if you go back and look at their recurrence, 39 uh, uh, patients or 90% had no recurrence. Only four people uh, had a recurrence. And we'll go over the individual uh, uh, details. But if you look at uh, uh, non-resolution, three people did not resolve despite fecal transplant. Uh, uh, one had no improvement, one underwent a co colectomy because of ischemic colitis, and other uh, died within the seven-day period, uh, once again due to cancer, uh, uh, but uh, the C. diff seemed to improve, but unfortunately because of the criteria was very strict, we, couldn't, we had to put that patient uh, as non-resolution because the patient died within seven days. So the 30-day all-cause mortality was four, uh, eight percent uh, uh, patient, with and all of them had severe CDI. No patient died from CDI or, uh, 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 or intestinal microbiota transplantation. All the mortality was related to cancers. Uh, some had Hodgkin's, uterine, ovarian, and uh, GBM. If you look at resolution of CDI, it was 93.5% uh, in our study, uh, compared to 92% reported overall in the literature. Uh, and lack of response in three patients uh, from the beginning was probably related because uh, uh, one of them had a brain abscess, had to be on antibiotics, and other per there were so total two people had act active antibiotic use, and one person came in with an underlying ischemic colitis in addition to C. diff, so that's the person who underwent colectomy. What about recurrence? Uh, uh, CDI recurrence rate was 9.3% uh, compared to 20%, uh, uh, and plus you have to uh, 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 understand that we used a much more stringent criteria for recurrence, which is 100 days, compared to the 30 days uh, or, two, or four weeks reported in most literature. Recurrence in four patients was attributed uh, to continued use of antibiotics in two patients. Only two patients truly had no risk factors uh, of antibiotic use or PPIs or anything uh, that we could think of, uh, and we couldn't explain as to why uh, they kept on recurring. Uh, so if the 30-day all-cost uh, mortality was about 8%, uh, uh, compa uh, compared to about 12.5% report in the uh, literature. Uh, uh, but if you look at attributable mortality to CDI, it was zero com uh, compared to 69 to 7.5% with conventional management. So plus, we have the largest uh, uh, experience uh, of successful use of IMT uh, in the treatment of severe refractive CDI. Currently, it's 15, uh, according to this uh, uh, report, but we have probably doubled the number now. Uh, uh, overall, in the world's literature, uh, uh, there is less than uh, 10 patients, individual case reports. One had like uh, four patients. Uh, so we have the largest experience to treat acute uh, severely ill CDI in the hospital and successfully uh, uh, curing them. Limitations, retrospective study, lack of randomization, documentation bias, it's single-centered, selection bias, lack of control group. So, so uh, uh, in our study, we concluded that uh, uh, INT proved to be safe and effective for refractive CDI and can be easily performed in either inpatient or outpatient setting. And it should be considered for any patient with severe CDI, even if it's the first episode. 
So I have to uh, thank uh, infectious disease division, Dr. Zervos, who was instrumental in uh, getting the uh, protocol through uh, to all the committees, and Dr. Langarden and Dr. Laura Johnson for uh, uh, at least mental support, if not physical support. Okay, so, okay, uh, and Dr. Uh, Alaradi in GI division is the other partner in crime who does the colonoscopic route, and he has excellent nursing staff, excellent, excellent. There are two people, uh, Pauline and Vicky, who do all the mixing, so Alaradi doesn't have to mix. <laughs> For my patients, I mix. Uh, uh, and microbiology department, Dr. Lenard Samuel was instrumental in uh, getting all the donor screening free of cost since we don't have billing codes, uh, uh, unlike transplants, uh, uh, solid organ transplants, where we have proper codes to bill. Uh, and then Stephanie was the uh, nurse uh, practitioner or a clinical nurse specialist who was responsible going through uh, committee to committee to committee to get this uh, through uh, because I, can't, uh, I don't think I would have had the patience to go through all those committees. Thank you. This is a uh, very terrific and uh, spirited presentation. Um, I, I assume that you don't have a uh, tool bank yet. We are. Uh, uh, we, we are. have a lot of donors. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, having said that, uh, uh, we have had numerous people with post-chemotherapy related uh, patients. They've had at least a liver transplant patient successfully treated with this one. They've had, uh, in literature, they've, they've treated patients with severe acute allergenic uh, bone marrow transplantation, severe GVHD, uh, and uh, uh, they did fecal transplant according to, uh, with CDI. They resolved. Uh, I mean, I probably would not do CDF uh, uh, fecal transplant in a patient who's neutropenic uh, uh, in a, in a uh, uh, acute uh, febrile neutropenic period. That I probably wouldn't do. Okay. Uh, other than that, uh, I don't see a reason for any immune suppression because it's well proven in any, every disease and immune suppression is not a contraindication for fecal transplantation. So a quick question. Uh, first is, uh, so, so people who would you think will be high risk before they become high risk, if that is ever a scenario, uh, submit a specimen uh, beforehand and, and freeze, if you, if you will. So, and the second is, would you actually change your protocol now to add another line item for IMP for failure or maybe before failure into severe CDI? Uh, that's what I think uh, uh, the, for the second question. Yeah, definitely we have to look at this case and I'll let Dr. Langard and speak to it. For the first question, there have been studies of autologous uh, transplant before surgery, before surgery where they save their own stool specimens and then get it transplanted with their own stool specimens uh, after surgery because once they develop CDA, if they don't, we throw the specimen out. Uh, so that's been reported as well, uh, a small number study. Uh, other uh, other uh, thing is you can freeze dry the specimen, just freeze dry it and put them in uh, capsules uh, and then they swallow the capsules. Uh, that's been, but that's not been officially studied. It's, in, uh, uh, it's studied in the animal model, but not in the official study. I might just say there's a, there's a very interesting study that's ongoing in Canada by Dr. Vicky Liu and group where they're identifying patients at admission who might be considered at risk for C. diff and they're giving them preemptive therapy with stool. Uh, we'll have to wait and see, you know, the effects of that but they are doing it for people who have had one prior episode but are asymptomatic, I think, when they come in, and they're giving this prophylactically. So there'll be very fascinating data, I think, that emerges about the fecal microbiome. I'll just put in a plug here. You know, uh, uh, Ramesh and me, we have just gotten through IRB, a, a thing uh, where we are saving all stool samples that are submitted and positive for C. diff. It just got approved last week, and we'll do this for a period of a year. When we looked at 2011 data, there were 7,000 and, uh, I'm sorry, 750 patients, actual individual patients, diagnosed with C. diff. So even though we see our rates go down, the rates which I showed you is our nosocomial acquisition. We are sort of not counting patients who are in the hospital, go home, come back, you know, two weeks later, who are still probably acquired it here. So we'll get a better sense, and we are going to type these strains. So we'll get a sense, are these the same strains that they are colonized with, that circulate in the environment in the hospital, and so on. So it'll be very fascinating data, and we're also going to save all the stools from the microbiome studies that Ramesh is doing 
pre and post transplant and that also is being submitted to IRB to see what changes happen in the microbiome so that which are the important organisms there that actually affect this uh, effect and so on. So if you, if you took 100 people who are colonized with C. diff uh, and toxigenic C. diff, you will notice that at the start of the talk I mentioned if you took 100 people never in a hospital, 5 to 7 percent carry it. So the asymptomatic carriage is known. Again, if you take people who have been into the hospital and you sample them, it's thought to be 20 percent. So 20 percent could be asymptomatic carriers who it changes when you expose them to antibiotics. All of a sudden, the microflora changes. That's when, for some reason, it triggers increased growth because it has, simplistically, you would say, it's just more area, more turf to grow. And then once it reaches a critical mass, they believe there is some sort of signaling that happens. It turns on toxin production, and then toxin is produced. And that's, so there is asymptomatic carriage. If you take these patients, if you do PCR testing on these patients, that's a wrong strategy because PCR will keep detecting them for a long time because you'll be picking up a lot of carriers. So, so in our stem cell transplant patients at Carmanos where we had rates that were 10 times the general population, as I mentioned in my talk, we found 14% came in with C. diff in their gut and uh, all of them go on to get disease. So that's something to keep in mind that Asymptomatic carriage, why we do not put them in isolation, is generally those patients go to the toilet. It's contained. It's not an incontinence tool. No one else is handling it. But I also make the case in this current day and age, we need private rooms for every patient because you know, sharing toilets is not the best of things. Even if you have someone who's not incontinent, with carriage rates of C. diff that are so high. So. Healthcare providers is somewhere in between. They say 5% in the normal population, 20% in patients. Healthcare workers fall somewhere in between. It also depends partly on your diet. Meat diet seems to carry more than non and then vegetarian diet and so on. But the strains are slightly different. But hospital workers carry generally the strains found at the hospital. What about the family contact members of the infected patients? It's a risk. So all we tell them is don't take antibiotics because eventually they'll, you know, the colonization may not be permanent. But in places where there are outbreaks of C. diff that are poorly controlled, sometimes if you're diagnosed with C. diff, your EMR is marked, so it flags if you're readmitted. So you go straight back into isolation. So we are not doing it here because we don't see a sustained increase. We have seen a decline. But Uh, uh, the, so uh, the if, if the stool sample is typically screened for uh, a, a toxigenic strain by PCR, but let's say that uh, nowadays we are actually thinking about stopping that uh, because if the person has normal flora, it doesn't matter. They seem to do okay. They, see, they seem to do okay. But typically, generally, uh, if, uh, we are trying to see if we can screen them. Symptoms are far more important too. Uh, absolutely, sir. Okay, so, uh, 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 so uh, for the nasogastric route, we say anywhere between 12 to 24 hours prior to the procedure, we stop the conventional antibiotic therapy, uh, uh, and then we do the procedure the following day. Uh, and subsequently, they receive no antibiotics. No, no antibiotics for C. diff, obviously no antibiotics for anything else as well, if preferably. Another question, Dr. Alangiran. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you were screening some of the uh, stem cell transplant patients. What do you think the cost effectiveness would be on just screening all comers uh, yeah. and then they, they deciding on therapies accordingly? Yeah. I think, uh, you know, the question was, what is the benefit of screening everyone who's admitted to the hospital? I think basically what we are planning to do in a somewhat prospective manner with the collection of stool is we're also collecting clinical data for our local environment to see 
which areas or locations are we seeing higher rates of C. Diff. Right now, I cannot track a transplant patient unless I just look at H6. They could be in the ICU, things like that. So by doing it more prospectively, we we'll get a subset of patient who may be at greater risk. And then we could say maybe this group of patients, there may be a role for preemptive surveillance maybe. If they are colonized with a toxigenic strain, should we kind of give them prophylaxis? But I might also make a case, if you want broad spectrum coverage in this setting, I would say use cefepime and metronidazole rather than going to a carbapenem or, or things like that because you may get some benefit from the metronidazole aspect of it, you know. But that is, those are all questions that are yet unanswered, you know, whether if you look at all of your cefepime flagell versus piptazo or imipenem, are there differential rates, you know, because of the flagell? I would say targeted therapy, limited broad spectrum use is the key. And there may be a role if we can identify high risk patients for surveillance with preemptive therapy. But that would be a very fascinating question to answer. Any plans to flag uh, any EMR using our new system regardless of what we're going to do with that data? Yeah. I think it's an important issue as far as C. diff and also things like KPC, where there is no drugs to treat, you know, a carbapenem resistant things. So we can put up alerts, uh, but I think we have to have a strategy after the alerts trigger. You know, what are we going to do? Are we going to do surveillance sampling, perirectal swabs of these patients to see they no longer have C. diff or KPC? And if so, for how long do they stay in isolation? So I think once we identify a high-risk group, I think we'll then be able to define a downstream strategy. How do we proceed with active surveillance? And when do you take them out of this? If we ever see our rates go up, I think we'll certainly, those are some of the strategies we hope to consider. Okay. I just want to add one comment. You mentioned on the slide that you came from ARC that there was a difference between the transplant patients, which is a little bit lower than the uh, general CDI. I want to add a plug here that most transplant centers use transplant infectious disease as consultants mm -hmm. and get their input on yeah. antibiotic stewardship. And I think that's my personal yeah. bias. Uh, and if you would comment yeah. on that. I think, you know, uh, the role of uh, infectious disease has clearly been shown in HIV. If you have a patient with stable HIV care provided by general practitioner versus consultant, they have clearly shown outcomes, even if it's just a nurse practitioner who does HIV care all the time. Similarly, the use of infectious disease consultant in high-risk patient groups. You do a million-dollar transplant, and if you don't have a support staff who kind of uh, more familiar sometimes with the literature, infection control, things like that, I certainly think it translates into better outcomes. So I think some of this collaborative work that we are trying to establish, the database, I just want to identify areas where we can improve quality outcomes for patients. And CDF, even though we think of it as a nuisance, you saw the cost factor, length of stay, even mortality in our own population, though we have to tease out that data, you know, why is that uh, issue? So I think going forward, we would uh, encourage you all to consult us. You know, this may seem like a simple issue, but there are ramifications downstream that I think would be useful to do collaborative work on. C diff is generally considered, and you know, I would call it an obligatory anaerobe in a way because when you grow it in the lab, it needs perfect anaerobic condition. We have tried growing it in in those jars with a it doesn't consistently grow. Uh, so, but in the lab, in the anaerobic chambers, it grows almost even if you freeze the stool sample, you have 100% viability when you bring it back. So yeah, I think it is. Follow <laughs> I, I think I'll leave it to Ramesh, you know, as the next project. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Langadan and Dr. Ramesh for a great